Japan in World War II. Friends, we've already told you quite a bit about the Japanese industry. However, the picture will be incomplete if we do not mention in our stories about Japan the sad event for all mankind that was the Second World War. Perhaps there is not a single corner in the world that was not affected, even if not directly, by this bloodiest and most terrible war in the history of mankind. It was a hellish period in the history of our planet, a man-made reboot of the whole world which it had never seen before. And Japan played one of the main roles in this bloody performance along with such large countries as the USSR, the USA, Germany, and the UK. From our past stories, we have well consolidated the fact that Japan, in the late 19th and early 20th centuries, was, well, a very militarized state, and even with the status of an empire, the state poured huge funds into the military budget. The Japanese army, after the country opened up to the world, applying new experience and technologies, grew stronger and became one of the most powerful in the world, and it happened very quickly. Many would envy such a pace. And here, it's necessary to explain and understand one fact, or rather to give an answer to the question, why? Why did the Japanese need all of this? The answer is on the surface. On the surface, that is, of the Pacific Ocean, in the form of a small piece of land on which the proud Japanese people huddled. Moreover, there are quite a large number of people, all of which means one thing. The empire needed new resources and territories. This would strongly ensure the development and growth of the economy and the country as a whole. Japan was simply aiming to expand its influence in the Southeast Asia as much as possible. Well, the methods of achieving these goals, as we understand, have already been chosen. The seriousness of intentions can be confirmed to you by the fact that in the best years for the Japanese army, the military budget was almost half the country's budget. Almost half. According to this indicator at the time, perhaps no one in the world could surpass the formidable samurai. And of course, with such military power, Japan could not have missed participating in the most ambitious military campaign of the 20th century, which Adolf Hitler from distant Germany was about to begin. But before Japan officially became a participant in the Second World War, its valiant and motivated warriors were quite successful in the nearby regions, and they were not even confused by the fact that almost any invasion of the Japanese into the territory of any country meant just insane logistics. After all, it was necessary to transfer a lot of troops and weapons, since all this was originally located and produced on their island. So, it was also necessary to ensure the movement of all these forces onto enemy territory. Can you guess where the historically high demand for trucks, military and transport ships, aircraft and aircraft carrier groups came from? An example of Japan's struggle for its interests can be in the military campaign in Manchuria. More precisely, there were several of them. Now, it is the northeastern region of China and part of the Russian Federation, and at the end of the 19th and beginning of 20th centuries, many states claimed their rights to these Asian territories. Most of all, of course, China, known at that time as the Qing Empire, had claims to Manchuria. In fact, it was a historical part. In general, it's probably worth telling a little bit more about this region, and it seems like everyone, or at least many people, have heard about it, but no one really understands where it is. Firstly, the region is so-called in honor of the people who once lived and had their own state there, the Manchus. It is located on the very edge of the Eurasian continent, near the Japanese islands. Very convenient, by the way, to attack it from the sea. You see what we're talking about. If we talk about the current location of the countries then, as we said, one part of Manchuria is a part of China, and the second one is part of the Russian Federation. These main parts are separated by the Amur River. Some sources indicate that the modern Sakhalin Island was also part of it, but this is not accurate information. In the south, the Chinese part of Manchuria mainly borders the DPRK. In ancient times, Manchuria did not live quietly in any way and was divided into separate regions, then united again. Now you can meet Manchus, Mongols, Tungus, Koreans, Japanese, and Russians there. But besides China, it was also Russian and of course Japan, which was also looking at Korea at the same time. And Japan's disputes with Russia over this issue eventually escalated into the Russian-Japanese War of 1904 and 1905, in which Japan won and established its spheres of influence on the territory of Korea and the southern part of Manchuria. All this once again gave the Japanese Empire confidence in itself and in its army. The most important thing is the correctness of the chosen path. Obviously, the Japanese also wanted to restore order and get rid of all Western European colonies in Southeast Asia. But, as we remember, it was difficult with resources, and it's a bad idea to fight with the Europeans without proper preparation. That's why Japan decided to upgrade its military skills and seize resources in mainland China. Moreover, the Qing Empire, aka China, collapsed and weakened as much as possible. The moment to invade China was the best you could think of, and so, in 1931, Japan again invaded even deeper into the territory of Manchuria, and this time using all resources. China didn't really resist. 
As a result, Japan took control over huge territory, including Korea and Manchuria, which then formed the state of Manchukuo. In this new state, even though the Chinese emperor seemed to be in power, he played a nominal role. In fact, everything was under the control of Japan. This is at least evidenced by the fact that the Japanese army was based in Manchukuo. And it turned out that Japan had direct access to the borders with the rest of China and Russia than the USSR. In fact, the base for further conquests was already formed. And on July 7, 1937, Japan committed a provocation against China, resulting in a local battle between parts of the Army of China and Japan. This conflict is known as the Lugao Bridge Incident. It was a very strange, somewhat funny, and seemingly staged story from Japanese military leaders, and some people say it could also be the machinations of the opposition forces of China in order to make the ruling leadership confront Japan. By the way, this provocation is also known as the Marco Polo Bridge Incident. If you don't go into too much detail that it was like this, one part of the bridge was controlled by the Japanese army, which allegedly conducted exercises in those parts. And on the other part of the bridge, there were Chinese soldiers stationed in the Wanping Fortress. Nothing foreshadowed trouble, but early in the morning on July 7, 1937, a message came to the Japanese fortress that a Japanese soldier had disappeared during the exercises, and Japanese commanders ordered Chinese forces to unlock the gate as they would look for him there personally. The Chinese twisted a finger at the temple and sent the Japanese proposal to hell. In response, the Japanese had already presented an ultimatum threatening to bombard the fortress, and in general, they kept their word. They opened fire on the fortress at night and even occupied part of the bridge, but the Chinese called for reinforcements and pushed back the Japanese forces and completely liberated the bridge. After that, the parties seemed to even try to agree on something, but periodically would shoot at each other. The negotiations, of course, came to nothing, and the Japanese Empire finally got the long-awaited reason for a fight and moved on to a full-scale invasion of China. The lost soldier, by the way, seemed to be found, but nobody cared anymore. In 1938, Japan strengthened the group of troops and again launched an active offensive, both in the north and southwest of China, and the Chinese took a desperate step. They opened the dams of the Huanghe River. As a result, the water washed away everything in its path over a huge area, taking with it 400,000 dead, including most of the Japanese soldiers. 10 million people were left without shelter, and this flood destroyed a huge number of crops and farmland. As a result, a severe famine broke out in the country. And so in 1939, the Japanese Invincible Army received two very painful slaps in the face. First, they were seriously defeated and forced to partially withdraw, backed by the Chinese army. And a little later, Japanese forces lost the battle on Kalkingol River, where they, trying to claim Mongolia, had encountered the Soviet Mongolian army. In that battle, the 6th Japanese army was completely surrounded, which was a real shock for Japan, who had clearly underestimated the capabilities of the enemy. As a result, the truce was concluded with USSR. Thus appeared the non-aggression pact between Japan and the USSR. By the way, the same document was signed between Germany and the USSR, and as history showed, they pretty much just wasted paper. And when the invasion of Germany and the USSR into Poland began in 1939, the Japanese decided not to get into the European conflict, since they themselves had enough worries. It would seem that a powerful alliance between the USSR and Germany was maturing in Europe, but after a while, despite any agreements, on June 22, 1941, Germany launched an invasion of the USSR. As for the seizure of Chinese territories, Japan did not achieve new success and by 1941 had actually suspended further progress. China turned out to be a tough nut to crack. After all these events, there was a change in priorities in the minds of the military leaders of the Japanese Empire. And doubting the 100% success of land military campaigns, the Japanese began to reorient their military capacities to the maritime direction. If it didn't work on land, time to try it at sea. Despite the fact that China showed its power, the Japanese Empire would not be an empire if it abandoned its expansion plans. Now the samurai have already thoroughly aimed to subjugate the colonies of European countries. Moreover, they have already had plenty of combat experience. They decided to start with the British colonies in the Dutch East Indies, and of course they immediately got a bunch of sanctions from the host countries of the colonies and the United States. Japan's reserves and assets abroad were frozen, and a complete embargo was imposed on oil imports to Japan. And this was almost the entire volume of imports to this country. In such conditions, it would be hard to fight because there would simply be nothing to refuel military equipment with, and their own resources and reserves would not last long. In general, the economy was under threat after imposed sanctions. Japan needed to come up with something urgently. And then, the United States began supplying weapons to China. It was necessary to act decisively. By the way, this development of events as a whole strategically influenced the course of the entire Second World War because despite the non-aggression pact between Japan and the USSR, 
the Japanese had a secret plan with Hitler, according to which, as soon as Germany captured Moscow, Japan would immediately begin an invasion of the USSR for its part. But the Blitzkrieg was delayed by the Germans, and then the rest of Europe and the USA blocked the fuel supplies. The Japanese immediately denied the idea of invading the USSR and focused on nearby regions. Who knows how it would have been otherwise. So, in the current situation, the Japanese general staff decided that it was necessary to crush all the colonies of Western countries in Southeast Asia. Thus, to provide yourself with an advantage in geographical location and at the same time to get additional resources. After all, if the enemy does not have military bases in the Pacific Ocean, they will have to conduct military operations thousands of kilometers from their native shores. And this, to put it mildly, is inconvenient. And of course, the main problem for Japan was the U.S. Navy. Now, it's unlikely that Japan considered a complete victory over the Americans, but some kind of stunning pinpoint strike could be inflicted. Japan decided to hit the most sensitive pain points, and in this situation, the enemy would hopefully think about negotiations. So, on December 7, 1941, the Japanese armed forces shook the Pacific region and Southeast Asia. One of their main targets was the U.S. Pacific Naval Base at Pearl Harbor in Hawaii. The Hawaiian operation of the aircraft carrier forces of the Japanese combined fleet against the U.S. Pacific fleet was developed by Admiral Yamamoto Isoroku. The strategic main goal of this operation was the conquest of the entire Southeast Asia, including the oil fields of the Dutch East Indies. Early in the morning, Japanese planes took off from aircraft carriers located 230 nautical miles from the Hawaiian Islands. The submarine fleet was also involved. The first wave of the attack consisted of 183 aircraft that appeared over Pearl Harbor at 7.55 local time. The Japanese managed to achieve complete surprise. The damage to the U.S. base was simply incredible. Now, about this sad event, we would need to shoot a whole separate video. Surprisingly, the United States did not lose a single aircraft carrier on that black day for the Navy. The next day, the U.S. declared war on Japan. And Adolf Hitler, being impressed by the success of the Japanese, in turn declared war on the United States on December 11th. Italy joined him. And on December 13th, Romania, Hungary, and Bulgaria also declared war on the United States. In parallel, the Japanese army was developing a powerful and lightning-fast offensive directly in Southeast Asia. It captured Thailand, attacked the Philippines, and forced surrender of British troops in Singapore. This base was a symbol of the military power of the West in Asia. More than 80,000 British soldiers and officers were captured at that time. As a result, in two to three months, Japan managed to capture almost the entire Southeast Asia and a number of islands in the Pacific Ocean. By the middle of 1942, the Japanese Empire had a huge territory on its hands. But it's one thing to capture, and another thing to keep. But all these successes of Japan were crossed out in June of 1942 in the Battle of Midway, where, due to dubious decisions of Japanese military leaders, the Japanese Navy and aviation suffered a serious defeat in battle with U.S. forces. Such a defeat that they simply could not carry out any further offensives. This was a turning point in the Second World War in the Asia direction, and at the same time on the mainland, the USSR stubbornly opposed Hitler's Germany. Now, Japan was no longer thinking about expanding the empire, but was trying to keep at least what they had conquered. And as you know, an empire collapses exactly when it stops developing. The Japanese tried to persuade the U.S. and Britain to negotiate in order to fix the agreements in their favor, but unsuccessfully. The Allied forces, realizing the situation of Japan, allowed themselves to be distracted by the Western European direction, and Japan tried to raise activity in China again. Maybe this would have been possible to achieve success on the mainland. As a result, they were able to conquer a certain part of the Chinese territories, but lost some of the conquered islands, which returned back to the Allies while the main Japanese army conducted operations in China. In 1944 and 45, a series of battles followed on the islands of Southeast Asia, the result of which was the liberation of territories from Japanese troops. The empire was crumbling. In Europe, Hitler faced new troubles. Well, soon we'll tell you about the denouement of the storyline about Japan in World War II. The military power of the Japanese was falling, and soon the Chinese army also went on the offensive and the support of Allied forces. The remnants of the Japanese were knocked out from both island Asia and mainland China, but the Japanese government, despite the deplorable situation, did not even want to think about surrender, but it began to actively prepare the population for defensive measures on its territory up to the guerrilla war. Knowing how the Japanese would fight for their native territories, the Allies understood that if they stormed, the losses would inevitably be great, and the conflict itself could be seriously delayed. On the morning of August 6, 1945, a B-29 bomber of the U.S. Air Force took off to the air and dropped an atomic bomb on the Japanese city of Hiroshima for the first time in the history of mankind. 
Three days later, on August 9, 1945, Soviet troops launched an offensive on Manchuria, and on the same day, a second atomic bomb was dropped on the city of Nagasaki. So far, these are exceptional cases in the history of mankind, when such a terrible weapon was used in a military conflict. There are still disputes about the expediency of this application. As a result of these bombings and the consequences of them, according to various estimates, about 150,000 people died. After such a shock, the Japanese leadership agreed to surrender. On August 15, 1945, Japan announced this, and the act itself was signed on September 2, 1945, by which time the Japanese had finally been knocked out of Manchuria. This day is considered the official date of the end of the Second World War. In the process of forming the act of surrender, the Japanese leadership asked for one condition, to leave the formal status of the emperor as the ruler of Japan. Surprisingly, even in such a situation, they did not forget about their traditions and the honor of the emperor. When we look at Japan now, it's hard to imagine that everything we told you about was real, but at the same time, we see how the priorities of an entire country can change and how useful it can become for society 